His name was common. His passion was not. Not just an artist, a worker artist. Joe Jones was a man with deep-seated loyalty to the working class, a man of the people whose work reflected struggles, changed perceptions, and revealed truths. This is the story of No Ordinary Joe. Born in St. Louis in 1909 and the fifth child of Anna and Frank Jones, working class was in Joe's blood. His father was a house painter, his grandfather a stonemason. Jones came from a very humble background. And so they were in that stage of economic circumstances that was quite dire. As an adolescent, Jones decides to explore the world beyond his parents' doorstep. He decided that he'd had enough of school, so he set off an adventure and hoboed across America, riding the railroad lines all the way out to California. Traveling in that way, you were certainly confronted by some of the most um, extreme uh, scenes of immiseration of, of, of people really reduced to the lowest levels of human existence. And that helped Jones to really identify as a young man with the poor. He eventually made his way back home, and I think his father said, it's time to settle down and, and start working. He began working alongside his father. He could be found sometimes doodling on sides of houses, then covering up his work with long sweeps of color. An exhibition of modern art in St. Louis inspires Joe to investigate painting on a different level. By age 19, he's gone from painting houses to painting canvases. And he's found his place amidst a new group of friends, reveling in the gregarious camaraderie of the local bohemian radicals. The Blue Lantern was a bohemian cafe that was in a rat-infested warehouse. And it was the place where Jones and his coterie of young writers and, and ne'er-do-wells drank and they smoked and they entertained and they, they had conversation. They had conversation about politics, about poverty, about racial injustice. And there, it was really there that Jones began to understand what a community of like-minded individuals could do to make a difference. And in many respects, I think it was that experience, that identity with the working class, that began to really shape not only his political beliefs, but the subject matter that he would begin to choose very early on in his artistic career. He moves to his own studio space over the garage of a residence. He meets an aesthetic dancer named Frida. The stock market crashes. It was the beginning of a time of great hardships, and while his paintings would soon reflect those hardships, that work wasn't immediate. Joe started out as most artists, painting what was familiar. Around 20, he exhibits for the first time. He also wins his first prize, $100. That income provides the sense of financial security he's been waiting for. He and Frida get married. In November of 1931, he holds his first one-man show, 26 oils and three lithographs. Local reviews emphasize the modern quality of his work, and by the end of the year, he's selling. He got a lot of attention from people. I think that something about his story really appealed to people, and also that in combination with his sort of energy and passion and his good looks really added up to uh, package that people wanted to support and take an interest in. Jones declares his pride in lack of formal training. When I set out to paint, he says, I don't have to remember a lot of rules. I'm painting to please myself. He's developing a distinct viewpoint. I'm not interested in painting pretty pictures to match pink and blue walls. I want to paint things that knock holes in the walls and he changed the way he signed his name. Elizabeth Green was an arts advocate in St. Louis, and she befriended Joe Jones sometime around 1933. And they formed a friendship, and she served as a confidant for him, and she supported him uh, 
both financially somewhat, but more so by encouraging her friends and her social connections to patronize him and to support his efforts artistically. They developed a, a symbiotic relationship. They developed a relationship of mutual dependence. Jones and Elizabeth Green were sharing a kind of depth of feeling and of support that really verged on perhaps a mother-son relationship. What that actually was, we never know. She was certainly older than Jones. Not long after they meet, Elizabeth, Joe, and Frida go on a whirlwind road trip visiting galleries in New York. They also stop in Detroit to see a controversial Diego Rivera mural. He walks up to it to a pretty surprised audience, to say the least, and runs a wet finger over it. And um, <clears throat> people are shocked. And he says, well, this is how real house painters tell if they mix their pigments right. And so if it's good enough for a house painter, it should be good enough for Diego Rivera. But it was their stop in Provincetown, Massachusetts, that presented a major turning point in Jones's career. There, he found a group of like-minded artists who presented a belief system that helped him make sense of the struggles in the world he was trying to portray. He becomes a communist. I think in communism, he found a way to kind of uh, direct his desire to knock these holes in walls. Communism in the 1930s was understood as an ideal, uh, a source of hope for people, an option that people hoped would really work and would make the conditions better for a lot of impoverished people who were not thriving under capitalism. It was about action and change, and um, so there was a sort of earnest rank-and-file quality to the kind of communism that he had. He identified himself as a worker not just an artist representing workers, but as a worker himself whose own experience, whose own devotion to art as a craft was on the same par with the iron worker, the field laborer, the shipbuilder. It's not surprising Joe begins painting fiercely, angrily. He needs to say something with his painting. He also wants to share his passion with others. He gets to do just that teaching art classes for an integrated group of unemployed artists in the old courthouse. He had them uh, assist him in producing a mural that was, I believe, mostly chalk that showed labor, people agitating, um, scenes using a lot of communist iconography to equate some of uh, the New Deal policies with fascism, or at least with uh, problems caused by capitalism at minimum. And also, he brought in uh, an exhibit of Soviet posters, uh, he said, to teach design. Certainly, once he started making that mural and working with the students to do that and having such explicit communist messages in the mural, uh, I think it, for him, it was he wanted it to be a point of, of um, contention. He wanted to draw attention to it. He, he wanted to see if he could um, it, if it could be a, a flaring point, I guess I should say, for consciousness. With accusations that he was teaching the art of protest, not just art, he shows up one day to find the door of his classroom padlocked. The Dust Bowl was still very much on Jones's mind, and he gets the opportunity to paint it. Jones was hired by the Resettlement Administration in the su late summer of 1936, and he was hired specifically to spend about eight weeks traveling through Region 3 of the Dust Bowl. There, he was meant to really document the impact of this great ecological disaster on the communities that he experienced. And he took photographs, he made sketches, made watercolors, all in an attempt to not just accurately show what this great disaster was bringing to these communities, but also to bring a bit of poetry to it. And what really began to emerge out of this work was a kind of iconography of the Dust Bowl, the sort of forlorn, abandoned shacks that were eroded with dust, the non-working windmills at which emaciated cows gathered around. All of these became the symbols, those points in the poetry of this great ecological disaster. A devastating period for farmers across the Midwest. The Dust Bowl was a time in our nation when farms were lost, dreams were buried. The resulting social blight left a landscape and its people shriveled to next to nothing. It was this to which Jones was intensely drawn. 
And for him, it was the perfect job because here he was being asked and being paid by the government to go and document with the expectation that change would occur. This was the, the great dream come true for him, deepening his understanding of their experience, understanding what poverty in the rural lands really meant, and developing a whole series of paintings that were just absolutely powerful in their impact. The time he spent traveling across the Dust Bowl had a profound effect on Jones. Amid the poverty and labor strife, he had again found a subject that fed his passion. Rather than landscapes of an idealized rural life, in the Dust Bowl, he discovered scenes of depression rock devastation, quite different than the scenes in his wheat paintings. 